in this side right here. And I'm the program coordinator at the Chicanx Latinx Student Success Center. Today we have the honor of having wonderful folks in our plática today. We have our two wonderful moderators, Elizabeth Jimenez Montelongo and Dr. Jonathan Gomez, who are going to be leading and engaging us with great questions today for today's plática with Roberto Lovato. And a little bit about Dr. Gomez and Elizabeth. Elizabeth Jimenez Montelongo is an SJSU alumna, and she's an artist, she's a poet, and a 2021 creative ambassador of the San Jose Office of Cultural Affairs. And Dr. Jonathan Gomez is a longtime supporter of the Centro, and he's also an assistant professor in the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department here at San Jose State. And lastly, for today's plática, we have the honor of featuring Roberto Lovato. And a little bit about Roberto Lovato for folks who are joining us today is uh, was born in San Francisco to Salvadorian immigrants who raised him in the city by the Bay's historic mission district. He is the co-founder of Dignidad Literaria, where he helped build a, move, a movement advocating for equity, literary justice for more than 60 million Latinx persons left off the bookshelves in the U.S. and out of the national dialogue. Roberto is a recipient of a reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center, and he has reported on numerous issues taking place in Mexico, Venezuela, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and among other countries. So please help me in giving a warm welcome to Elizabeth, Dr. Gomez, and Roberto Lovato. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, appreciate everyone for coming. And I'm going to open up just with a, a few words and, and just say first and foremost that you know I want to give a shout out to you know the students of uh, Semillas um, and you know the students of the Culture Counts uh, reading series. And you know to to get us going today, I wanted to just kind of contextualize for us uh, the importance of uh, why we are here. Um, and one second, there it is. Um, and so, you know, I just want to again say welcome and just say that, you know, this afternoon uh, we come together to listen to and learn with Roberto Lovato. And he will speak with us about his book, Unforgetting, which operates within a powerful Salvadoran tradition of forging words that inspire love and mobilize people to struggle for a livable destiny. It is no ordinary time to gather to talk about such things specifically from a Salvadoran perspective. For decades, but especially over the last two presidential administrations, Salvadorans in the US have been labeled as criminals, framed as disposable, and pursued by various law enforcement agencies as deportable people. In our current COVID-19 conjuncture, the crisis has only become worse. However, in the maelstrom of information that is manufactured and managed by dominant news networks, we are hard pressed to know how. In fact, many of us learn about the gravity of the crises that migrants face and the fight against it from those stories on social media posted by community organizers in the streets, blocking the gates that lead to prisons where migrant families are sent to be caged and forgotten. We also learn from journalists such as Lovato, who choose to use the word to illuminate truths, challenge erasure, and inspire critical thought in a society that fosters collective imbecility through corporate media and corporate educational institutions. For those who benefit from the current relations of power, they would like for us to forget migrants in cages, community organizers, and also the freedom-loving traditions of Salvadorans. These are traditions cobbled together by the frontline eyewitnesses to US imperialism, people who face various forms of radical division that emerge from man-made scarcities and resources and state sanction and or extra legal violence that go unaddressed and unpunished. In unforgetting, Lovato uses the word to introduce us to different people who shape these traditions. People like his grandmother, who in the midst of being abandoned by the state and a damning patriarchy that loomed over everyday life, refused to abandon others. The use of the word in this way is important and they create what poet and musician Avacha calls la palabra musical, a use of the word to envision and enact new forms of social belonging, new rhythms for remembering, and new forms of coalition, coalitional action where people seek to achieve visibility, 
and advance their freedom dreams for a world they believe they, we are worth living in. But as important as these words and these spaces have been for oppressed communities, they've never been as imperative and they've probably never been more vulnerable to closure and silence as they are today. The COVID-19 conjuncture has created many cleavages in our communities. Many enduring forms of hierarchy and exploitation in our society have only been frustrated by the challenges associated with what is required for everyday survival for so many people. This environment creates many obstacles for the most vulnerable among us and their tactics at speaking truth to power and more regular, are more regularly denied any legitimacy or they go demonized in every corner of public life. And so we come together today to hold space with someone who in this context chooses to use the word to stand with those who we are told do not belong and do not matter. We don't come here foolishly claiming that the word alone will set us free from the problems that plague us, but we do gather to insist that the word has a role to play in the world and that our stories, when told honestly and genuinely in the fashion that Lovato tells his story of family migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas, has a promise to bind us to our ancestors who fought for us to be here today and to inspire us to move along a road that leads to a world that is grounded in peace, dignity, and social justice. So I encourage all of us um, you know, to give Roberto Lovato our attention and to contribute to the conversation when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Gomez. Um, Roberto, we're very excited to, to have you here today. Um, we love your book. <laughs> and um, we wanted to start by inviting you to just share um, a few words about your book, how, um, however you'd like to introduce your book and um, possibly read us a small section. If you'd like to unmute your mic. Ah, sorry. Um, the honor really is mine to be with you. Uh, I feel very at home with you because I know a lot of you are like me, you grew up in the Bay Area. I'm here in San Francisco on Mission Street, home to what was the greatest cruise in the Bay Area. I'm sorry, Story and King, but we were number one back in the day, but I did go to Story and King to cruise in lowriders, uh, some of which were bombs, we called them, old cars that are rounder, they kind of look like bombs. And, uh, but seriously, I'm really privileged and uh, I love talking to this audience as much as any audience that I've talked to around the country because it's, especially the young people are part of my main audience. Um, and I'll share with you why along the way. Well, my book, Unforgetting is, a, it's, a, it's basically at one level, it's a search for me to understand in 2015, um, the year that El Salvador became the most violent country on earth, to understand the violence of El Salvador, but also of the country that helped sponsor that violence, the United States. And so um, that's at one level, it's my search to understand the violence that turns kids into killers. You know, I've been at this for 30 years, not just as a, as a writer, but as a former revolutionary, I joined, as you read in my book, I joined the FMLN guerrillas and I was an urban commando. Even though I was born in the US, I made a commitment to this tiny country that is my parents' homeland. And I sacrificed as much as I could, uh, but not as much as others who gave their lives. So I felt knowing what I know, and I've been, this has been secret up until last year, I've been, I've never been out about having been a militant, right? Uh, what I would say a poet warrior was my aspiration. And I'll talk about poet warriorship and uh, 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 the ways that uh, Jonathan in that beautiful introduction kind of laid out about the power of the word. I'm a very romantic person about the word and about the deed, about actions. So at a deeper level, my book is a journey into different underworlds, some of which many or all of you will be familiar with, like the underworld of our family secrets. All of our families have secrets. In my case, I grew up on Folsom Street here in the hood, down the street from the projects, and in an apartment, crowded immigrant apartment, with pictures of all my mom's tias, tios, her, her mom, 
her nephews, nieces, everybody's dog and their dog's grandmother, you know, all over the walls. But on my, but we only had one picture of anybody in my dad's family. It's like, whoa. But I never noticed it because it was normal to have my dad's family life be a secret. I'm sure some of you can relate. So my book's at one level, a, a dive into the underworld of my family secrets, into the underworld of my dad's psychology and his experience, his is intense. Um, at another level, it's a journey into the underworld of gang life. You know, I've been at it 30 years since the gangs were starting in LA when I lived there in Pico Union, in, uh, Pico Union Westlake. And I worked there at Carecen. It's a journey into the underworld of uh, migrant communities that I've reported on and had in my family. And it's a journey into the underworld of the guerrilla, right? Of the FMLN guerrillas. And so I bring readers into this journey that that's an underworld journey, which is why I have the 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 title unforgetting because I got it from the Greeks who believed that um, when you died, you either went to Elysium or to Hades. But before you died, you had to cross the Lethe River, which was for them called the river of forgetting. So that the dead had to forget who they were in life. By the same token, Salvadoreños, the greatest poet in El Salvador's history, Roque Dalton, who was also a guerrillero, um, and a brilliant poet, uh, he came up with the phrase que todos nacimos medio muertos en 1932. We were all born half dead in 1932. And he was talking about what happens when we have all these family secrets combined with genocidal, and I do mean genocidal violence. There's a feeling you have. It's not unlike what, say, the survivors of the Holocaust Native American people, uh, slaves and uh, people, enslaved peoples and, the, and their descendants and others. So um, the word for the Lathe River was uh, Lathe, right? L-E-T-H-E. The word for, for unforgetting is Alethea. A, na, forgetting. So the river of unforgetting is where I got the title for the book because it's, it's a journey into unforgetting. So what I, with that introduction, what I'll do is briefly read a section. Um, you know, we just celebrated International Women's Day and we don't celebrate women generally in society. So I think I'll continue the celebration despite it not being uh, International Women's Day with your ce celebration to introduce you to a figure who is critical to my life. One of the many women in the book who really are the, are the you know, the, the, the lights of, uh, of our lives. Um, in my family and in and in the revolutionary movement. So um, the context is I'm I'm um, in San Salvador, I, um, trying to figure out what the hell is am I, me, this kid that grew up on the mission in the mission, doing, blowing up airports and and and, and sabotaging infrastructure as a revolutionary. What the fuck am I doing? Is my question. I'm sorry, professores, if. I, I use language I shouldn't be using in with the students, but they're old enough to use and understand it. I've, I know students. So I'm giving myself that poetic license. And so the setting is I'm, I'm with the Comandos Urbanos working there for, for several months. I'm like, damn, what am I doing? I'm trying to figure it out. And I had left a woman in San Francisco, here in San Francisco in the mission named G, who was a diplomat for the Farabundo Martin National Liberation for, for the guerrillas. And so we started hanging out and I gave her signals, mixed signals that go with being a 20 something dumbass that I was, right? Who I, I was in love with her, but I didn't know what to do with love when it came to me. I don't know if any of you, of you have ever met a guy like that where you love them and they love you, but they don't know what the hell to do. So that guy was me. You know, I'm not that guy anymore. I know what to do now, but back then I didn't. So, so um, I left G así en jabón, como decimos en salvadoreño, on soap. Kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, but, and she was like, so, uh, and, and, and I'm in this, and she was a, remember, a revolutionary who 
couldn't come to the country because she was on the lists as a diplomat of the people, if they found them, they would kill them on site. So I'm in San Salvador trying to figure stuff out, 20 something dumbass, um, but committed to the revolution and, 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 and developing a part of myself that, that, that is actually one of the best parts of me um, combined with another part of me, the love part of me, that is also the best part of myself. And they're not separate. Our revolutionary sense is not separate from our love of humanity. Because if it is, then your politics suck. Okay, so I'll just leave it there for now. So I, I mean, I get a phone call. I got my shock months later as I was lying on in my apartment in San Salvador, sipping some cola champagne, one of the piss gold soft drinks every Latin American country has. I was reflecting on how things had changed for me since leaving San Francisco the year before when the phone rang. An unusual occurrence, given that I lived in a place few except the compas at Cryptas knew about. Bueno, may I help you? Hola, Beto. The silky sweet voice sounded familiar, but before my heart leaped, I paused. G? By the way, G is, yeah, G, her name is G, because she didn't want me to use her real name in the book. G? I, yes. Where are you? San Salvador. What? Yes, I'm here. You're here? I said, my voice reaching higher octaves of disbelief. Yes. I remained silent for a moment, stunned at the fact that this woman who publicly represented the FMLN had somehow managed to get into the country. The Salvadoran government had her, had her and other publicly identified members of the FMLN on their list of people to detain on site at any airport or border crossing. G could be killed if they caught her here. What are you doing here? I'm here on some important business and need to speak with you. She said in her trademark, no nonsense tone. Uh, sure, when and where do you wanna meet? Let's meet where the light shines, she said, which was code for Las Antorchas, an open air restaurant frequented by the compas. The compas are, is our name, we call ourselves the compañeros, and revolutionaries. The restaurant had torches placed all around its edges. I wanted to know about this special mission almost as much as I simply wanted to see her. I showered, put on some nice clothes, and armed myself with my secret weapon, Jovan musk oil, my preferred cologne. I showed up a little late to find a smiling G. Whoa. I showed up a little late to find a smiling G already there. A white-haired guitarist played, played Aya, a lovely bolero from mom and pop's era, in front of a couple at a near table nearby. G was looking ever the summer beauty in a black flowered dress that hung on her tight body wonderfully. The Salvadoran sun made her round face look especially radiant. Being G, she rocketed us through the nicely then, and then started in with the reason she'd come. The smell of flat iron beef grilling beneath a thatched palm roof and the fancy blue tropical drinks with little wooden umbrellas in them gave the restaurant on busy Boulevard de los Héroes a suave, intimate beach vibe made stronger by all the antorchas. So T, she started, I'm here with some important news. How did you get into the country? The compañeros got me some glasses, a wig, and a fake passport, and I came in through the Guatemala border, she said, and Bos Bajita. Wow, that's pretty gutsy. Noting her need to talk about the mission, I asked, so what brings you here? Well, to be honest, you left me in limbo, T. Huh, limbo? What do you mean? What the fuck is she bringing this up for? Before you left, she said, when we were getting to know each other in San Francisco, you said we were more than friends. You gave me chocolates, you wrote poetry, and gave me other signs that led me to believe that what you said was true. Oh, uh, well, that's kind of true, I guess, but yet on the other hand, you left things ambiguous, she in interjected, like you weren't sure we, what we were after such beautiful moments we spent together. Okay, yes, I said, still waiting for the mission, for the larger mission to reveal itself. You know me, Beto. You know that I like to be clear, she said, sounding like, gee, the focused diplomat and explosives expert that she was. 
Yes, you do. You know that I don't, I can't stand ambiguity. No, you can't. So I will just tell you, Tito, I will just tell you, Tito, I'm in love with you. and need to know how you feel about me. I've been living with this ambiguity since last year and want you to be clear with me. I can't keep living this way. Uh-oh, that's what she fucking came here for? Me? Fuck. Subversive in war turned also to mean subversive in love. My immediate thought, G came to undermine my game plan for macking on lots of women in wartime El Salvador. But I also recognized our shared desire. I kept looking at her in disbelief and the rush of memories came to me. Walking near my old church, talking about opera, feeling like she actually liked me for me, despite feeling like a fucked up kid in a mission. Fuck. So I did the obvious thing any red-blooded revolution, revolutionario salvadoreño macho would do in such a potentially explosive situation. Uh, excuse me for a second. I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Uh, okay, G said in a tone that said, what the fuck? On the way to the bathroom, I walked up to the old guitarist dude playing music in the restaurant and whispered in his ear. Then I went to the bathroom, combed my curly hair, and washed my face before I came out blasting like I was Michael Corleone, Corleone entering gangster life in the Brox Italian restaurant. I strode back to the table. So you want an answer? I asked, standing before her with the guitars behind me. Here's your answer. The guitar started playing Sabor a Mi. I first learned the lyrics of the classic bolero turned lowrider oldie about the lover's taste when pop used to play it for mom. Now I put his Orphic powers to, my, to use myself. I started serenading G. The song ended. I smiled and said, there's your answer. She smiled back and got up to put her face close to mine. We paused to inhale each other's breath and then our lips finally touched. We decided to go to a cheap motel used by prostitutes working near Tia Esperanza's house on Cinco de Noviembre Street. Early the next morning before dawn, as we floated out of the motel high on new love, we were greeted by the sight of soldiers who were about a block and a half away and coming our way. We turned and walked away quickly in the opposite direction, hoping that a taxi or some other vehicle might come in our direction, but there were no cars in sight. An attorney passed before we saw the lights of a vehicle approaching, surely our last opportunity to escape torture and likely death. So that's just a, a little bit of the kind of the action love scene in the, in the book. That's a love story that evolves. Um, I, and that's kind of the way I talk about revolution because, you know, it's really is true what Che Guevara said that, you know, um, Love and revolution really have to be inseparable. Otherwise, your politics suck, as I said. So take it yes. away. <laughs> yes, thank you, Roberto, for um for the wonderful introduction to your book and for reading us that, that passage. Um, I really enjoy the fact that you share um throughout your book, like the personal, you know, the um the family and the love story and all those stories that you know that, like you said, are part of everything. Um and so um, we have some questions prepared for you. Um, some are from um, the students at San Jose State and from San Miguel de Centro America. Uh -oh. um, so we just kind of put them together. So um, one of the questions is on um, the students at San Jose State University, particularly those in San Miguel de Centro America, would like to hear about your experiences as a bicultural Salvadoran. How do you navigate your identity and how does that influence your work as an activist and journalist? That's an excellent question. Um, let's see, hold on. I, I wrote down some notes about these questions. Give me one. Um, oh, sure. Feel free to, um, yeah. to just totally like briefly address them. They just want to hear about your bicultural experience. All right. Well, OK, Whatever. my bicultural experience, it's, that's pretty easy. Um, I, I was born in the United States on Folsom Street here in San Francisco. Working class parents from El Salvador. My mom was a maid, my janitor, my father was a janitor with United Airlines and he was involved in like in this underworld criminal activity. 
they actually inherited from his mom, my mama Tay, I found out. So I had these issues about Salvador and I then I was like, oh, I don't know. We would always go to El Salvador and I kind of loved the volcanes. I loved my cousins in play, Escondelero, Loteria, and things like a lot of you do with your families when you go. But I wasn't sure about this, this other stuff, these shady things that my dad brought, like going out and you know, being with prostitutes with this guy whose guts I hated, Don Ebe, who I describe in the book, how much I want to beat him up when I, when I was a kid. So my, my and, and then there was underneath all this, there was, remember you're talking about the 1970s, underneath the surface of Salvadoran life was the war was bubbling, getting ready to blow up in the eighties. It was already there. People were being killed. There were bodies in the seventies and everything, but it really went full scale because the FMLN had evolved to the point where they could no longer had any option but to take on a revolutionary struggle and try to overthrow the government. So my only refuge from these contradictions in my family and about being Salvadoran was being American. I was a good little gringo. I cried at San Francisco Giants baseball games. You know, I pledged allegiance to the flag in class. I thought the US, I played with GI Joe and plastic, you know, uh, toys that were very militarized. And, you know, that was my identity. And then over time, and, and my family gave me like this postcard identity of what it meant to be Salvadoreño. Whatever you're from, whether you're Mexican, Salvadoreña, or whatever, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. Our parents try to paint this beautiful picture and they leave out the stuff that explains, man, why do I feel so fucked up sometimes, right? Working class people, especially, or whatever your class. And so, you know, the post, the, the, the contradictions of being Salvadoreño and, 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 uh, and of my family, um, you know, my, I eventually started growing. And one of the things I actually hooked up, hooked into was Chicano culture through the music, like the lowrider music, like Sabor Ami, and the actual lowrider culture. There weren't a lot of Salvadoreños here like there are now. You have to remember, we're talking about the 1970s when I would tell people, you know, like at the Emporium, where I would go with my friend Freddie Weinstein to ride the rides. And, you know, the, the, the guy at, a, at, a, at one of the rides said, hey, what are you guys, Arab or something? I said, no, no, I'm Sal Salvador. My family's from El Salvador. Salvador, where the hell is that? You know, and so um, there, weren't, there wasn't a presence of Salvadoran or Salvadoran culture in, in large scale. So I had to go to Chicano culture music. I mean, I can dance Norteños better than most Chicanos. In fact, I'm sorry to break the news to some of y'all, but I learned from my friends, like my friend Armando, who took me to his hometown in Los Herreras, Durango. And so I mean, we're all, you know, in the United States and around the world, we're all mixed cultures. There's no border walls, except in the imagination of fascists like um, Donald Trump. So I, I was into Chicano culture and I still am, but eventually all these Salvadoreños came and I started finding myself engaged in the culture and then engaging with the people and then engaging with the refugee populations here and then re engaging refugee populations there, seeing the war, some of the most horrific things, but also some of the most inspired and heroic things and the lyricism of the music of revolution. And I was like, damn, this is badass. So I'm gonna do it. And I started adopting a, not just a Salvadoran identity, but a Salvadoran revolutionary identity because our identities don't need to be tied to nations. And I don't suggest that we, we, we stick to that. I think nations are you know, largely about killing people and dividing us, right? Flags are, were designed to take indigenous peoples away from their indigenous armies and culture and bring allegiance to the flag so that you would kill and die for that flag. With El Salvador, the United States, Mexico, you name it, that's what the flags are for. So uh, I adopted a, this different revolution that carries me to this day. I'm American with an accent on the E, right? Because I don't call myself American at all, except when I put the word in accents. And so I even had a TV show for a minute. You can Google later on um, on Telesur. I had a show called Americans. And my slogan was, uh, welcome to Americans. The show where going south means things are getting better. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm really committed to these, uh, these issues and the way of looking at ourselves 
in this way, but it's all rooted in 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 in, in local you know, local things. Really, identify identify as a mission person. I I do believe the cruise on Mission Street was more badass than the cruise on Story and King. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone or your parents or your abuelos. That's just how it is. And we can duke it out if you want, but you know. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. Um, Jonathan, would you like to? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I want to throw in this mix of uh, the Mission Cruise and Story and King. Uh, on my home turf, we're talking about Whittier Boulevard. So, uh, no, I just playing, but uh, we, we can. Uh... LA's <laughs> trying to make an appearance in this Bay Area movie. <laughs> And so, you know, thank you for that. That was beautiful, uh, Roberto. And, and my question, you know, it relates to, you know, the fact that you mentioned how art, the art of music and poetry brings people together. Uh, you give us examples of how, you know, it played a role in your own family, um, you know, bringing together uh, the Mareros in LA and the Pico Union District, and also like the music and poetry the, of uh, the FM LN. And, we, you know, we're curious to know about what role visual art had played in your revolutionary identity uh, or just, you know, your identities as you were growing up, uh, especially the murals in San Francisco, right, in the Mission District. And, you know, if there's any other Salvadoran uh, visual artist uh, that, you know, you pay attention to, you know, students were curious to know if Fernando York was someone that, you know, whose art that you pay attention to. Oh well, yeah, Fernando's, I met Fernando back when he was alive. Uh, um, you know, yeah, I love his art. It's beautiful. It's 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 folkloric, but I've also met artists who are, I think, more of a more political bent, like my friend Isaias Mata. You can go here in San Francisco and see the greatest mural in the Mission District, hands down, and I'm speaking objectively, is um, on St. Peter's Church. The whole corner of the church is this gorgeous mural that shows Latin American history, but a Latin American history that includes us here in the United States. Right, and, and that's kind of the, it's a visionary thing for me because um, I learned to, to believe, for example, that we here in the North are the um, northernmost expression of the insurgent continent of America. And we have to see ourselves like that more and more. This is why Latinos in the United States right now are being erased systematically within the national dialogue of the United States. Something your generation is going to have to take on frontally and defeat, and it's not just a white thing. Okay, you can tell anybody who's awake knows that there's a systematic erasure of us in U.S. literature, in Hollywood, in Sunday talk shows, in the media, in journalism, and other avenues of public life in the United States. So, you know, thankfully, I grew up in the Mission, man, with like all those murals, we had the highest concentration of murals in the world here in San Francisco because of the mostly Chicano muralistas who started that movement right back in the day and who then you know, invited Salvadoreñas and other even white muralists to join them in kind of literally painting our walls with our colors, with our stories, which was, I mean, you all have like some of that down in San Jo. You got that mural that I think it, it got taken down not too long ago. The, the that was a, a, a used as a peace, uh, 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 a medium for peacemaking. I remember, I forget the, the name of it and where it's located, but mural de la mural de la raza. Mural de la raza, yeah. And so those things, along with like Santana's music, like if you listen to Santana's music, when you look at those murals you're looking at the moment of the 1960s and 70s in the mission, when San Francisco was a center of counterculture in the, on, on the planet itself, right? Where you had black power, brown power, Eastern consciousness, you know, um, labor struggles in the, in the ports, the beats were here, um, you know, psychedelic culture, hippie culture, and Santana's music People like it because of the power of this great artist to channel all these different patterns of consciousness that are going through the mission at that time. You know, I mentioned some of it in the book and we all here in Northern California and San Francisco and, and so we are inheritors of that and we have access to that and we have to 
you know, kind of really, really, uh, I think, excavate more of that history and and create more, like 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 Elizabeth is doing with her poetry, and you scholars are doing with your scholarly work, and you students are doing with the pain in the ass, you know, midterms that you have right now, or whatever it is you have, right? So, um, you know, I I uh, yeah, no, San Francisco. San Francisco is an anemic, the present day San Francisco is not my San Francisco. Mm. So I'm trying to document what the Jedi knowledge of that period was. Mm. So I can drop that knowledge for you all that are gonna face this epic crisis that is gonna be your life for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. And we just have to face that. And that's why I wrote Unforgetting was because, you know, I, I decided to come out as a former revolutionary because shit, I got nothing to lose at this point and I need to transmit whatever Jedi knowledge I have at this stage of my game because I have a, a boy that I raised, I have nieces and nephews, I have a community I love and I know what's coming and it's some of it, a lot of it's not gonna be good. It's gonna be a lot of crisis and I'm not even talking about COVID. I'm talking about the decline of the United States itself and, and and its effects on us. We're already seeing that US decline means the erasure of Latinx peoples, clearly. So um, you all have to um, do your part, I think, to, to kind of con counteract that because I put in my time already and I'm, I'm gonna check out pretty soon. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. Thank you for the, your, um, your responses and for sharing so um, openly and honestly with us. Um, so I have another question that um, I'm looking forward to hearing your, um, your perspective on. So the same style of policing developed in the United States to imprison black and brown communities was introduced by US politicians as broken windows policies later implemented through Central America, such as Plan Escoba, Plan Broom in Guatemala, Ley Antimara, Anti-Gang Law in Honduras and Mano Dura in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. What are some successful challenges to the style of policing in El Salvador and in the US? Oh boy, whoever came up with that, that question wants to be a pain in my ass because that's a yeah. hard question, man. Um, oh, we're just interested to hear your um, Okay, was that you? Perspective. Was that you? It was not. <laughs> yeah, whoever that was, you know, I'm not. You're the I'm, expert. We're looking for guidance here. We're, Okay, to well, resolve these issues. Please, well, I gotta put on my journalist hat. Like in the book, <laughs> I talk about like what I call counterinsurgency policing. I mean, and and let, let me step back for a moment and just give you a context for how I understand policing right now. Um, remember, I'm talking about the United States is in decline. So one of my professors at Berkeley back in the day, Manuel Castells, told me about, like he said, watch. The United parts of the United States are going to start resembling the global South in terms of the abandonment of entire cities, as happened to Detroit, or was trying to happen after Katrina in New Orleans. And there's whole parts of any city you go to that are devastated, like South Central LA to this day, right? Southeast LA, man, a whole industrial thing. And so, um, so, so, so anytime you start making something like the global south, that formula for the elites has to include policing because you're not gonna solve the problems, but you're gonna introduce policing and militarism that sustains the status quo, that keeps people in their place. That's why all your neighborhoods have all these, um, what we used to call pigs, all right? So I don't know what y'all call them now. Some of y'all have families, times have changed a lot where I have family who are cops and I have family who have been in prison. A lot of our families are like that now because of this uh, mass industry that they've created where people's economics depend on policing other people and imprisoning them. So I started coming onto this because of the war in Salvador. And um, like, you know, there were trainers that the US sent to El Salvador in the 60s and 70s who started training the military and the death squads. I've interviewed some of these cats and some of them actually have reached out to me for my book 
to apologize and say they were moved to tears by my book and they wanted to somehow make amends. And I'm talking to them. I'm going to have them give me some detailed information that I can, I can use. And then, you know, they want to feel redeemed. Hey, I'm, I'm, I, I think anybody can be redeemed. Okay. And I think we have, if we had a society like that, we wouldn't have a lot of these bullshit problems that we have. So, um, so, 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 so the Pentagon trainers after the war, guess where they ended up? LA PD training, LAPD training San Francisco Police Department because the decision at the elite level had been made to militarize US policing, right? You see this, especially in LA, in the person of somebody like um, Daryl Gates, who was there when I was in LA, and I was there at the tail end of his, his reign of terror, right? And the policing model that he built, which was, he was the one who innovated SWAT, special weapons and tactics. SWAT units are nothing if not militarized policing. You just look at their uniforms and just look at the uniforms of cops from when I was growing up watching a show called Adam 12 or Dragnet. For those of you that can go and look in the archives because it wasn't your era, but the, the cop uniform used to be really thin like this. And then look at, look at what's happened little by little, boom, boom. They start getting puffier and puffier like RoboCop. That's the militarization of US policing. And so the Pentagon helped militarize has helped and continues to help through Homeland Security policing. And so when the LA riots hit, a guy named William Barr, remember him under Trump, he was the attorney general under George Bush number one. And he sent these militarized policing to go back and train in 1992 and after when El Salvador is starting the peace process to train the new Salvadoran police forces. So. And he, he also used the theories and practices of uh, broken windows policing and they exported it to El Salvador. So that you've got the inner city of the US starting to become more like a Southern country, right? With the abandonment of entire communities because of globalization. And so just like in America Latina or Africa, where when they empty out the resources, they police the shit out of them. They, they militarize them. That's what's happening to us here now. That's what Black Lives Matter is fighting, right? You can see it. So, I mean, and this is a bipartisan, like Barack Obama has done more to militarize US, US policing than most presidents through Homeland Security, giving them tanks, giving them, you know, weaponry that's like designed for Iraq and, 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 and but being introduced into the inner city because the inner city has been emptied out the way that the colonies were. So in other words, we become colonized again here. You know, we were colonized back in the day. If you read, like my friend Rudy Acuna, Occupied America and other, Mario Barrera and other scholars, I'm sure you, you may be reading today. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's a circuit that goes back and forth and they re, you know, they reintroduce these ideas and it goes across borders now. Yeah. Thank you, Roberto. Um, yeah, we're just trying to you know, make sense of oh, I got muted, sorry. Um, yeah, we're just trying to make sense of a lot of issues that are going on today and um and you know, like even local tra tragedies here in San Jose. Um mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing your perspective on that. And um I'm not sure if Jonathan has another question or else he can move us into the um Q and A portion. Yeah, absolutely. So um did we did we want to ask him some of the the questions that we got from before this, or did you want to open it up to the chat? Um, oh, we we have we did collect some questions um, from students and community that we can start off with, and then um, if the people here um, want to drop questions in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, if you submitted a question um, via the the Google form, also you you're welcome to. Um, Reshare your question in the chat to make sure we we see it, and we'll we'll try to get to as many as we can. Or we'll pick the ones that are um, like different. Um, did you have another question you wanted to? No, you can you can go ahead and you can you can go ahead and ask the questions that you okay. that we collected. Okay. Um, well. Okay. 
So what are some effective ways to approach the subject of the United States role in the violence and gangs in El Salvador and Latino America? I think you, you answered that one um, a bit right now. Yeah, just um, my other yeah. response would be, we have to do it in a way that cuts the bullshit that we're given mm -hmm. by the government yeah. of El Salvador and by the media. Okay. Um, and how can we most effectively advocate for the children and families being separated and imprisoned at the border? Oof, if I had that one, I would have worked feverishly to end this abomination of humanity. I've been with those kids. I've been with those moms in those prisons. My book opens in the opening, like my journey of the book begins because I go to one of these immigrant prisons in South Texas and I meet, you know, and I'm, I'm in this prison where like, I didn't talk too much about it in the book, but like some of the moms had slit their wrists and some of the children, they had, you could see the scars. Some of the children had scars on their neck from trying to hang themselves. And this was in 2015 and guess who was president? Barack Obama, right? But I was told you're gonna offend the black community if you expose this truth. Okay, so then the black community is okay I'm supposed to understand is okay with um, children trying to hang themselves and women trying to slit their wrists. I basically think that's a low opinion of the black community and I don't share that. So I'm gonna tell my truth anyway. And I have a lot of black people in the black friends and black allies who support my work. Screw Barack Obama. You know, he started what is a fascist and I mean fascist practice of caging concentration camping, killing thousands of Central American children, like those that are dying in the deserts right now of Sonora and other parts. He really, he didn't start that, but he multiplied it, just like he multiplied caging and concentrating and mass separation by the thousands. I have the receipts. So how do we stop that? I think we're in a good moment because Obama, we couldn't, we, we, we really, some of us really pushed hard to expose Obama stuff and it's making it hard for Biden and Kamala Harris to do their movidas that the Democrats always do. But I still think we need to do the work to expose what I call intersectional empire, right? More and more in your age, the powers that cage, kill and separate and destroy children and other migrants and other persons are gonna be Democrats who look like you and me. They're gonna be brown, they're gonna be black, they're gonna be queer, they're gonna be you know, disabled. They're gonna be, I mean, I have a play that I wrote after Obama was president about the first Afro-Latina, Jewish, Muslim, disabled, blind, working class president of the United States who was acting just like Herbert Hoover or J. Edgar Hoover or Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama with respect to the poor waging war on them. So we have to get over these honestly ridiculous identity politics that try to limit our political action in the world. And I think the case of caged children gives us an opportunity to just come out and say, look, I don't give a damn if you're Democrat, Republican, I don't care if you're black, I don't care if you're brown, like Joaquin Castro, right? Everybody likes Joaquin Castro, but hey man, I was there when Joaquin Castro didn't say ni mierda about all those caged children, all those killed children, all those assassinations by the border patrol on the part of the Obama administration, all those massive immigrant prisons, like the ones I visited. Joaquin Castro said nothing. Okay, so I mean, me vale Joaquin Castro. Uh, but, but, but when Trump gets elected, he's there giving teddy bears to the children who were imprisoned in the jails built by Obama under Trump. <laughs> okay, so I mean, my, I say this only to illustrate this is the kind of work we have to do now. We can't be deceived. It used to be the mariachi hat, right? Hey, everybody, I have a sombrero and a mariachi, give me your vote. Then it was, si se puede, right? Which is why I came up with the app phrase, si se pedo, because it sounds like something good until you get close and then 
holy shit. There sí se puede in their way to 3 million deportations, caged children, concentration camps, you know, militarized policing, mass surveillance, seven wars. So I think the way at it has to be to be honest about the present and about the past. We have to, I think we still have to do the work to expose Obama for what he did. Okay, if you follow me on Twitter, you know this is, people think, God damn, you're obsessed, dude. But yes, I am. Because I want Barack Obama to pay for his crimes against hum child humanity. Okay, I feel, I've seen those children. I've seen those mothers. And, and, and I, I, you know, everybody knows Donald Trump did it, but nobody knows Barack Obama did it. So that's what I say to that. Yeah, thank you, Roberto. I think it is it is important to acknowledge that um, like you said it's an intersectional empire. It's um, there's a lot going on, and it's not even just the person that you know that put their face forward. Um, the whole like network of things going on. Um, so thank you for pointing that out and reminding us. Um, Look at what they do to the immigrant body. Don't listen to their words. Look at the immigrant body and what's happening to the immigrant body. Is it improving? Is the condition of the immigrant body improving? Or have we simply switched si se puede for, you know, to hell with immigrants like Trump, right? But at the level of the body, the same things are happening in imprisoning, caging, killing, you know. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, pay attention to what's happening to, to the body, our body, community's mm -hmm. body. Gracias. Um, so somebody had a question um, that they shared in the chat. Um, what was your everyday reminder to keep moving forward? So I think this is a question like about like hope and resilience, which you address a lot in your book. You know, my journey began when I was with those kids and moms, some of whom had tried to commit suicide. Um, I'll just tell you, I've seen so much shit in this world. I've seen how, um, how truly sinister the world can be to children. Um, and when I saw what happened to children, I started my journey, but my journey as a revolutionary began when I started seeing the bombing, the massacres, the mass graves filled with children and adults and elderly people. And I was like, damn, man, I wanted to take myself out sometimes. And as I describe in my book, what really saved my life has it continues to keep me positive and as fucking ferocious as I can be in the world is the sublime and the beautiful and the power of our people. You know, the the grandmother who doesn't give a shit if they call her a criminal, but she's gonna escape a, a genocidal culture where she lives in a shack trying to raise her children among a small town of prostitutes, entirely made up of prostitutes. My grandmother sold her way out and then established a network of contrabando. Some of you all probably have that in your families, in Mexico, the Mexicanos, I know, call it Fayuca, right? And other names. And, and so, but these were considered criminal acts. And, and if you want to criminalize my grandmother and my dad and me, so be it. But this idea of criminality is, a, is the crime, the way it's applied to so many of our people. Right now, look how many of our people are in prison. Look how many of our kids are being shot down and their lives don't matter. So um, what keeps me going is the, the people, the sublime, the power of the beautiful and the sublime. It makes for sustainable struggle, you know, and knowing, knowing that that allows me to fight another day. You can fight with the beautiful. I think that's the best way to fight. Makes it really hard to fight back against. And it's subversive too. You wanna to be dangerous. And I think you need to be dangerous in this increasingly fascistic system we live in. Be subversive with the beautiful. Yeah. You subvert your own, 
your own mind and all the programming that you have in your mind to feel like less of a person. Thank, thank you, uh, Roberto. And, and so uh, we have one more question and we we're hoping that after this question, you would be willing to read uh, a poem or the poem by Roque Dalton that you have in your, in your libro. But, you know, towards the end of the book, right, you, you, you have this uh, part where you're talking with Alex Sanchez, you know, director of uh, Homies uh, Unidos down in LA and just a you know, all around wonderful person who has, you know, seen the worst of the worst and, and wants to do the best of the best in the community. Um, and you talk about, you know, religion, right? You're having that conversation, but you also, in the book, you talk about, you know, yourself as, as uh, or you were telling Alex that, you know, Evangelicos had me on my knees praying for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm curious to know, uh, what, what do you see the role as, as, of religion, right? Or, or, you know, even if it's Christian evangelicals, missionaries and politics as they affect El Salvador and other areas of, of Latino, uh, Latino America, but also, you know, thinking about the conversation that you had with the youth towards the end and, and the spirituality that, you know, he embodied to get him through. So I'd love for you to engage that. Yeah, it's, it's real easy to just criticize people for being religious. I think it's too easy because, you know, some of, our, some of our people are so poor and, and our communities are so poor that we don't have too many outlets to go places. And the church has always been an outlet, even though that church, and let me be straight up, was part of the colonial project from the time of the Spanish conquest onward, right? Let us not kid ourselves. These crosses are full of blood, not just Jesus's, right? Nonetheless, some people like my mom have derived a lot of power and beauty. Like, look, I carry this around. Escapulario, que tiene la imagen de San Judas de Tadeo. And you can read in my book how much shit I've been through. I've been through some, a lot of shit. So, um, um, my mom swears, she's dead now, she died in 2013, but she swears that that's why I'm alive. Mm. And I still carry this for more than 30 years because in, in, in some deep part of myself, I mean, like when a bullet flies by your head, you don't think about, fuck, Karl Marx, save me, man. <laughs> you know, some people cry out for God. You know, I love Marx and Marx is important, but you know, you cry out for something larger than yourself. You look at your life and God forbid anybody would have to go through that. But uh, when you do, you, you're gonna look for that greater transcendent thing that we've been separated from uh, because our indigenous ancestors were separated from, from the poetry and the religion, which were the same. But the origins of poetry are inseparable from the origins of religion in the uh, indigenous cultures. So that's why I'm kind of like into this poet warrior concept that I'm starting to really work through and, 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 and think through because um, we need that transcendent power to face what's coming. You have to, even what's here now, some of you, some of you are struggling. Some of you know kids that have tried to commit suicide in the neighborhood. Some of you have family that's struggling under different undocumented status or domestic violence and, and, and things that our communities have been kind of forced into. So, I mean, you know, I was quite frankly, a right-wing evangelical fascist. Okay, I would be today, if I was like I was then, I would be a Trump supporting right winger, basically supporting fascism. And so that's one flank. There's another flank that I was introduced to that's liberation theology, Teologia, Teologia de la Liberación, which interprets the Bible as an emancipatory document, a document about freedom, and that Jesus was about fighting the empire. When I discovered that, I was like, whoa. Okay, and I'll just tell it, like, you know, I make these things and I don't want to promote drug use among young people or anything, but back in the day, I did smoke marijuana and I may have snorted some other things. And there's a thing where you transition from pot to say cocaine that I don't know if I did it or not. I, I, I'll take the fifth on that one, but um, 
that transition is intense, right? Pot's one thing. Coke is another thing. When you go from like right-wing evangelical faith and militancy, because they they teach you to be a militant in these evangelical churches, then you discover, man, you know, the Bible and God and Jesus and the apostles and the whole history of Christianity can be about the struggle for freedom. Damn. And that's what helped create the revolutionary movements in El Salvador and Guatemala and other parts of America Latina. I mean, I had friends who were guerrilla uh, priests. You know, they said, okay, I'm gonna take up arms for Jesus. Okay, it's a difficult thing to perceive, but you know, their interpretation of the Bible led them to fight alongside the poor like Jesus did, because Jesus was all about the poor, right? And so there's that, there's indigenous um, spirituality, there's, I mean, you know, there's different teachings. I, I think there's, I've benefited from that. I mean, being, a, even if it was fascist, right-wing evangelical Christianity got me out of the certain life that was dangerous for me, right? When I was kind of in the thug life. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing. There's no black and white about matters of religion and faith and spirituality. I, I don't close myself to it. I, and, I, and I see it, I see spirituality, you know, and I, one thing that poetry and literature has really given to me is like, man, as close as I've gotten to whatever it was like to be in a world where there was no religion because everything was spiritual. <laughs> And that's like the what they just it's the closest I have, like swimming in words is the closest I have to what I've heard being in the child's amniotic of the baby being in amniotic fluid of the mother, which is supposed to be that's this paradisiacal experience where the child, they don't have to worry about anything, man. They're just sitting there kicking back, sucking up all the love in, in the body of their mother, and they just have no worries in the world. According, you're like in the ocean, a mom. So um, that's my response to that. I think, oh, one other thing I'd say was a lot of you are struggling students with having parents who are evangelical and you're getting like these ideas in school and it's like, I don't know. Well, it, I mean, honestly, I think you have to be okay and recognize that in some cases, your parents have fascist inclinations. I hate to break that news to some of you, but that's a reality, even if they're not Christian, like in El Salvador, some Theos and Theos of mine were fascists. You know, I had a close relatives who were, uh, uh, had, uh, you know, I have, you know, one of my abuelitas loved this dictator. Okay, and I, rather than be afraid and idealize our parents, like some Edward James almost Mi Familia thing or something, let's kind of like, look, okay, man, this is the reality and I got to deal with it. So, Thank you for that, Roberto. Um, so trying to process all this, these new ideas um, that I'm learning. They're old today. ideas. They're old. <laughs> old and new. <laughs> They're oldies but goodies. They're like suavecito. Yeah. yeah I like your way of expressing them. So gracias. Um, I, I hope everyone had a, a good experience with that today. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, no, th thank you, uh, everyone who's coming here. We're hoping that, you know, Roberto, if you would close us out with, uh, you know, the poem in your libro by Roque Dolten. Um, and, oh, and, and, and just, you know, thank you again, you know, just uh, for, you know, everything you bring to this conversation, to the Centro for organizing, uh, you know, this talk. You know, we, we love the way that the Centro on our campus really functions as a really critical hub to, you know, center our students, to, you know, engage the various desires and needs that they have. And so, you know, Lily, Elisa, thank you so much. And Elizabeth, thank you for organizing, um, you know, everything with the readings and coming up with these great questions and, and, you know, for our community here. Thank you so much for showing up. Well, really, thank you to San Jose State, to Elisa for first reaching out, Lily for being the big jefa to said, okay, yeah, you guys can bring that pilon, whoever it is. <laughs> and um, especially to, to to, to, to Jonathan and, and Elizabeth, who were really thoughtful in putting this together. I was, I think I was prepared. I, 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 I gave you my best. This is my best. Okay. It was, I, I, it was I, amazing. I show you the respect because I give you my best because you're in the Bay Area. And if you guys see me on the fucking street, you're going to, if I do the lousy job, you're going to say, fuck, there goes that pendejo, lovato, man. So 
Um, I wanted to avoid that at all costs because we're going to run into each other. And I do hope we run into each other in San Jose when this COVID thing passes and we can have an in-person engagement. I would enjoy nothing more. So you've asked me to read a poem by Roque Dalton. Do you want me to read Spanish and English or do you want me to read the English one? You get to choose, sir. Okay, um, I'll read both. I think we need to honor right. our, 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 you can't say it's indigenous because it, Spanish is not a, Spanish is an indigenous language when indigenous people use it. Someone, someone voted for Spanish in the chat and um, I'd like to acknowledge also some members of um, Culture Counts Reading Series that are here with us today. Okay, um, I'll read it in both because you know what, it's okay to speak English. All right, it is, it's okay. It's, it's what we have. And so the poem is called Todos. And I, I first heard this poem and quite honestly, when I was a kid, I didn't know what the hell anything of it meant, except I was really fascinated with this one phrase that was todos nacimos medio muertos en 1932. I was like, man, medio muertos. I know what that feels like. And I just latched onto it later on. I. I realized what it was talking about, which was in 1932, there was a massacre, which um, it's called La Matanza in El Salvador. And it is uh, the most violent episode, not just in Salvadoran history, not just in Central American history, not just in terms of Latin American history, but in world history. According to scholars like Anders Sandberg, at Oxford University, who told me that, um, I mean, I put it in the book um, and I document it because people are gonna check my facts or you gotta do that if you're gonna write because a lot of haters out there. So you gotta have your facts straight. So um, Anders Sandberg told me that like in terms of the number of people killed per day, per week in a concentrated space in a concentrated time in Salvador, in 1932 supersedes on his graphs, World War I, World War II, Armenian genocide, all these places, as far as the numbers of people killed in such a short period of time in a small space. And my father, I find out in the course of the book, was one of the survivors and witnesses. He didn't say anything for 75 years. So that silence of my father and take note of this, young people, the silence of your parents contains the seeds of the things that can free you from some of that pain you feel. If you can understand what happened to them. You just got to figure out and be sneaky on how to get that information because it's not easy. So, um, so, you know, this poem trans is one of the most important poems in Salvadoran life and history, and it's called Todos. Todos nacimos medio muertos en 1932. Sobrevivimos, sobrevivimos, pero medio vivos. Cada uno con una cuenta de 30 mil muertos enteros que se puso a engordar sus intereses, sus réditos, y que hoy alcanza para untar de muerte a los que siguen naciendo medio muertos, medio vivos. Todos nacimos medio muertos en 1932. Ser salvadoreño es ser medio muerto. Eso que se mueve es la mitad de la vida que nos dejaron. Y como todos somos medio muertos, los asesinos presumen no solamente de estar totalmente vivos, sino también de ser inmortales. Pero ellos también están medio muertos y solo vivos a medias. Unámonos medio muertos que somos la patria para hijos suyos Podernos llamar en nombre de los asesinados. Unámonos contra los asesinos de todos. Contra los asesinos de los muertos y los medio muertos. Todos juntos tenemos más muerte que ellos. Pero todos juntos tenemos más vida que ellos. La toda, la toda poderosa unión de nuestras medias, de nuestras vid medias vidas, de las medias vida de todos los que nacimos medio muertos en 1932. Roque Dalton. Now, here's a translation uh, that actually, just a little background gossip there. Roque Dalton's son, 
Roque was assassinated by his own political party. And you know, there's still a case going on trying to bring one of our former commanders to justice for killing him. He belonged to a, another party from the one I belong to, but Roque Dalton's son was in the FMLN with me in a group called the Fuerzas Populares de Liberación. And he's a friend of mine. And he gave me permission to translate this poem into English. So um, I, I, you know, I didn't want to do it myself. So I brought in a, 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 a really dope poet, a friend of mine, a young man named Javier Zamora, who's uh, one of the undocu poets. And together we, we bring you this. We were all born dead and half dead in 1932. Alive, but half alive. Each one of us with a bank account of 30,000 fully dead, fattened with interest, with profits that today have grown enough to spread death unto those that keep being born, half dead, half alive. We were all born dead, half dead in 1932. To be Salvadoran is to be half dead. That which moves is the half of the life they left us. And because we're all half dead, the murders presume not only that they're completely alive, but also immortal. But they're also half dead and only half living. Let's unite half dead of our nation so that we can all call ourselves your children in the name of the murdered. Let's unite against the murders for of all, against the murders of the dead and the half dead. Together, all of us, we have more death than them. But all of us together, we have more life than them. The almighty union of our half lives, of the half lives of every one of us that were born half dead in 1932. Thank wow. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Um, you know, really appreciate everything that you brought, you know, with you to our gathering here. And we're just so thankful that, you know, you chose to engage us at San Jose State. No, it's my distinct pleasure. Thank you again. Um, I hope I didn't embarrass myself so that you guys are going to call me out when you see me in San Ho or here in the Bay, somewhere in the Bay Area. Um, and if you do see me, please, you know, reach out and and curse me, but reach out. <laughs> no, thank you. We were we were very excited about this event. We all were, and um, for me, it was even better than I expected. So thank you so much. No, my pleasure, my pleasure. You all, you prepared something really nice and you made it easy to give you my best because I really did give you my best, okay? It's been my honor. Thank you so much. Gracias. And if people are dropping already some love in the chat box, but if you can help me give a warm thank you to Jonathan, Elizabeth, and Roberto for being here with us and just uh, opening your hearts and uh, Roberto for being so transparent and open and sharing about yourself and your your journey. So muchas gracias. Y for our students here that are on the call still, thank you for staying with us. Really briefly, I wanted to share that the Culture Counts reading series is going to be facilitating two reading circles in April. So if you're interested in participating, uh, I'm gonna drop my email here, but uh, for students, you know, uh, you'll be able to receive a copy of Roberto's book. So if you uh, email me, uh, I drop my email in the chat box. I'll send you a copy of the book if you would like to engage in this reading circle in April. And I can send you more details later. So gracias, everybody.